So thank you both so much for uh, this wonderful movie and for joining us uh, tonight uh, to present it. I would like to start by going back to the very beginning of the project, how it got started, and I'm wondering if you guys knew about this tournament before you started working on the film. No one knew about it. No. Okay. It really was one of those um, incredibly unusual stories that you look for and you hope you're going to find, but that really no one knew anything about. Um, around the time, so in 2018, 2019, some of the teams had started to reunite after 50 years, one of which was the England team. It was helped by a BBC journalist who had uh, started to put some of the pieces together um, based on one of the women's brothers having visited a football museum and where the football museum had said there was no such thing as women's football in the 70s and he had heard that his sister had da 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 like, It's all these like tiny little p things that came together um, and eventually ended up in one story on a BBC radio thing in the UK that our producer Victoria's husband heard a snippet of and that's how we came to the story. But that's obviously not how the story came to everyone else, but that's how we started to hear about it and realized that there was a lot more to this. And when we started to dig, that yeah, it was as big as we, you could possibly hope it would be. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was really surprising to us. We made a lot of sport films um, previously and, and also Victoria, the producer who I've been working with for a long time, and we had never heard of the story. We actually, Rachel and I made a series for Amazon and we made a film sort of about the origins of the FIFA Women's World Cup and we didn't hear about that story in that, you know, case. So this was, do your Wikipedia line. That's always yeah. a good one. Yeah. When we, when we, f when, so when Victoria first called me and said, have you ever heard about this? And I said, no, I've not heard about it. I did the Google. There was not even a Wikipedia entry on this tournament at all. And what we will say is that now, in the sort of three or four years that we've been researching this, there is now a very extensive Wikipedia entry. It has nothing to do with us. We have not done that. That is the internet doing its own thing. Um, and people take on a huge amount of responsibility for the research, which we're really excited about as well. This isn't just us that's interested in it. There's a, there's a huge audience and a lot of people that are in their own right pursuing these kind of stories. But there's no book. There's no book. There's no book yet. Well, we're writing the book. Um, so my next question is uh, about the footage that you guys uh, have of the tournament. Like, it's so, uh, it's amazing footage. How did you guys come to get possession of it? Um, we employed a lot of people <laughs> around the world. Um, you know, the, the, the strange thing about this tournament was that you know, um, obviously nobody had heard about it. It was never rebroadcast. You know, it was broadcast at the time in Mexico and in a few other countries. It was always ambiguous about where and when it was broadcast. You know, the media, Mexican media at the time talked about lots of countries. I'm not sure how many it was actually broadcast in, but of course the final was, was shown in Denmark um, when they won. The, men's have, the men have never won in Denmark, but... The women have. But the but the final in Denmark was shown three days afterwards. Once they'd couriered the tapes back as fast as they could back to Copenhagen, and then it was shown on TV. Yeah. So so basically, it was a bit of a it was a bit of a detective job um, to, to to really look for it. And so we found some things a bit in news pools in different countries. You know, I mean, it's pieced together with. I mean, the footage is probably pieced together from about thirty or forty different sources of the tournament and we were looking for shots that connected together. And you, you can see it in the, as soon as you see any of the big, the, the, we started with, we had, we had a clip that was about 90 seconds long that was, um, had been kept via, through AP. And, but as you watch it, and as you can see, you can see so many cameras everywhere. And you're like, okay, there must be, they, someone has been filming this. You know it's happened, where does that footage exist? And so tracking that down. But what we would say as well, for anyone that's interested in researching anything like this, is you know, starting with the newspapers of the period. That's how we found out, that's how we really tracked the story, was that the newspaper, was, there was so much coverage. And those newspapers existed both in the memorabilia and the scrapbooks of the women who participated in the tournament from all the different countries, many of whom, particularly from the England team and the Italian team, had kept the had kept the articles but never had them translated from the Spanish. So we started with that and then we went into the libraries in Mexico City 
and found all the original um, uh, articles and just the full newspapers and magazines and went through everything with a very fine tooth comb. We, yeah, we, we found that if we asked men where the footage was, they didn't know where it was. <laughs> but fortunately, fortunately, some women had kept it. So that was, that was, they had that a, was, that was a good start. To, to look yeah, all the, all the archivists in Mexico City we owe a huge, huge thank, thanks to. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your working relationship on this project as, as co-directors? Did you divvy up certain sections of the film or were you working on everything together? Or how did that uh, play out during the production of the film? Well, I guess, I mean, we've been working together for quite a long time in on various different projects. Um, and they, that tends to to fall into sort of you know natural I want to say strengths and weaknesses but obviously neither of us have got weaknesses so that's fine rhythms natural <laughs> rhythms yeah. um and also depending on what we are, what else we were we were working on at the time um i think building up the relationships with the women themselves then and, and working in the edit things yeah i mean the, the important thing is you know we're trying to communicate a story and you know the auteur theory is all well and good that the french came up with but um you know, things are best through conversation and dialogue. We have we 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 had three editors on this film, I think three, four uh, two, actually. Well, well, two, three really. Yeah, but two, three. Anyway, but you know, all, all a conversation. <laughs> it's it's all a conversation, a conversation with our producers and trying to work out. You know, like there, I, as I said, there's no book. Like, what what is this? What's right? What's wrong? What's whose account? Yeah, all valid? of this is starting from starting from scratch, and you can see like we you know we did we we reckon we recognise it's getting a bit late, and we have the Q and A, so we're not going to keep playing the whole roller all the way through but you know the the reason you want to sit and watch the credits and the reason we have such a great song that goes all the way through the credits is that every single person on that team is hugely hugely important and you know for you know, even looking at the we're talking about how you find the footage and what we do with that the legal teams who've allowed us to really shape a lot of that stuff and who are doing a lot of the legwork in terms of ownership is you know that, that's a huge amount of people involved in from all these different countries um, and so it's all coming from a place of collaboration to start with. You don't make a yeah, documentary I mean, film like this without being entirely collaborative. Yeah, I mean, there's interesting, uh, like, you know, th there's a lot of things that, you know, through discussion about how you communicate, it, you know, we're trying to communicate to a global audience the story for the first time in lots of languages, but also what are the right things to say, you know. A lot of the women were very young that played in this tournament. A lot of the reason why they were very young is because they were told that they would be banned if they went there. So the older players didn't always go, particularly from the England team. I think the youngest player was 13 years old. 13 and a half, she will say. 13 and a half, yeah. But we didn't want to... W that was an important discussion that we had in the edit with our producers. It was like, you know, you can see in the footage this is a really serious tournament. The, high, the best players in the world are playing there. The minute we frame the story through, oh, but there's this great story and it's, she's only 13 years old. It, 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 that's what becomes the focus, rather, and that allows people to sort of diminish the story. So in trying to tell a story like this that's been suppressed and demeaned and people have been demeaned, it's really important to think about the value and the contribution of each. You know, sports films, generally you choose one team to root for. I think, I hope the audience will find it. And this was something that we really majored on was like, how do we make a f sports film where you go through and you are committed to every team in, in every eventuality, you know? And that's, that's the opposite of, of, of normal filmmaking. Um, so w we see all your interviews that you did with, with the players, but I'm curious uh, about the reactions that they had when you first contacted them, um, what was that? What was that like? Um, a, a lot of it was quite hesitant, um, and I think there was a lot of assumption on my part and on our part of saying, "Well, you know, every, they're going to be so excited when we've contacted them." But actually, again, something we've tried not to dwell on, but. I, we're pretty sure comes across throughout is that there is a sense there's a real sense of the the trauma that these women have been through they get to the highest point of their lives the most exciting thing they get to the point where something they've fought fought for that they're very proud of and that hopefully the audience has experienced and lived through in this tournament is taken away from them it's not just taken away from them it's kept from them for 50 years and they're told in some cases, almost that this didn't happen. A lot of these women hadn't even spoken to their children, their grandchildren about this. 
and so for us to turn up from the other side of the world and in some cases and to say in slightly broken levels of different languages yes we want to keep talking about this and we'd like to open this up and we're going to engage it on an international level was was a lot for women for some of the women to handle but eventually you know you you win out trust by sharing a big part of yourself with them at the same time um, and, so. uh, uh, you know, as you can see in the film, a lot of them were still really pissed off about the results. <laughs> <laughs> they, they weren't, you know, the Italians weren't that happy to talk about losing. <laughs> no, they, w they weren't happy to talk about losing, but they were very happy to settle the score and let people know what happened. And that memory is very, very real, and on the me Mexican side as well. I mean, I never forget, like, because of the way, you know, the way it's shot, it's, it's, they're looking straight at you down the camera lens, and a tiro indirecto, indirecto, and the number of times, I mean, it feels like we could have had that on loop, the number of times that Sylvia wanted us to know that it was in, a tiro indirecto. Um, well, it's fascinating to hear that that was the, the reaction that they had, because I think um, you guys opened the film with, uh, with Brandy Chastain and showing her this footage, and I think her reaction is one that I myself had, like, watching the film, and I think is, like, this underlying theme and, like, emotion throughout it, which is, like, there's so much joy in watching what they did. At the same time, there's so much anger at the fact that it's been hidden away it's like they've been made like ashamed to have participated in this can you talk a little bit about like about that that scene with brandy and carrying that emotion throughout the film uh that when, yeah. you know throughout it i mean i mean sure i mean you have to understand that so the england team have never seen themselves play so we showed it to in london two weeks ago at london film festival they'd never seen themselves because they were on the pitch it was never broadcast in England. The memory was taken away. There's a lot of anger at the heart of this, you know, and a lot of disbelief, you know. A part of the act of doing, making a film as opposed to writing a book is showing, you know, and, and, and that was really a big part of how we wanted to construct the film, and, and, and the film told itself as we found more footage, but, you know, that we wanted to show, show this. We wanted to immerse you in the tournament, you know. We wanted to make this an undeniable, because for all these women's lives, they'd been told it didn't happen, you know? And not only that, is they didn't have any evidence, you know? They had occasional clippings or whatever, but, you know, in a, in a language that their, their family didn't understand, so. So, on the, speaking of opening it up, I would like to open up the conversation to the audience if any of you have a question that you'd like to ask. The spotlights are a little bit bright, so bear with me as I try to point out if anybody wants to ask a question. Yes, right there. Right, so, uh, what was the English player's reaction to seeing the footage? Yeah, so it was just a um, barely like a week, just over a week ago, um, and so there were fourteen players on the original England squad. Twelve of them were they're all still around. Two were too unwell to travel, but four, like, twelve of them were able to come to the cinema with their family. Sorry, I can't quit. With their with their family and friends, and they in there. Yeah, there were a lot. There was it was there was hesitation beforehand. Um, a bit of trepidation, I think, and then there was just there was just a lot of excitement, then a lot of tears, and then yeah, they they were still processing it in the last couple of weeks that we felt. Yeah. But it really was a very, it's felt like a very rounded experience, I think, for them. I mean, they've had to talk about it a lot to us. You know, there's there's been many hours of conversation before we even put them on camera, and then they're on camera for a while. So they they knew sort of what was coming but i think the experience of actually seeing themselves on screen for the first time and having the whole story put together and something that they were really excited about which we found in all of the other teams as well was that they all found so much connection with what the other teams were saying and what the other women were saying even 50 years on they still felt that actually this was a huge shared collective experience yeah, I mean, it was interesting that, that so, so when we showed this at Toronto, we, we brought the Danish players over. And, and, you know, of course, they won. They should be feeling good about this. But they were suppressed too. But they, you know, they, they, they've only ever seen themselves from the pitch view. You know, they kept their memory is caught in that moment. So to suddenly see the scale of it and to suddenly be back there, I think they found it incredibly overpowering, actually, because then they were like, you know, 
it wasn't just about the ball or the other players. It was about this whole this whole universe, and there we are at the centre of it. You know, our memory yeah. is of ourselves is at the centre of this dream. Well, oh yeah, you see it in one one of the last comments from from Alba, the Argentinian player, when she says, you know, well, what you thought I made history, and that makes that's the first thing that made her choke up, and for them to see themselves put in this context having one never really believed it ever even happened for the last 50 years and then also stepping aside they're, they're so gracious and they'll step aside and say no no we weren't it wasn't that big a deal um so yeah i think that's it when you really show someone what a big deal they are it's really lovely <laughs> it's nice Elba's 86 as well right? yeah she yeah Elba's 86 and she's doing well so she was the eldest in the tournament at the time other questions? Uh, yes, sir, right here. Uh, did the Denmark team say what happened to the trophy? <laughs> so, uh, did the Denmark team say what happened to the trophy? Yeah, so the trophy disappeared. Genuinely, there's a whole other film. That can be the sequel if anyone wants to make it. <laughs> um, no, no one knows. They, they don't know. No one, no one seems to know what happened to the, to the trophy. The, um, it was a, yeah, well. Well, it's, it's a strange thing, actually, because I was at the football museum that you talked about only this week with my son, and they've now got a little display in the corner. They've got one magazine and a whole um, you know, museum of four floors dedicated to men's football and one, ma <laughs> one magazine uh, that they managed to, to get. Um, uh, um, but, you know, the, the World Cups get lost. The, the, the Men's World Cup got lost in, in 19... 66 and and uh, then was lost again in Brazil and has never been found. Yeah, they're quite valuable, I think. You know, so get, it got probably got melted down. Sadly, we think, you know. but we're not quite sure. Yeah, I think there was a question here. Yes, ma'am. So the question is that uh, women uh, today, some women are playing soccer well into their 60s, 70s, or 80s. Are any of the players um, that were playing in this tournament now playing soccer again and the, at the age that they're at now? Um, so I do know that some of them are playing walking football, um, particularly in the UK, and then there's a version of it in, in Italy. Um, but I think overall there's been there's not, there's not a hu there's not a huge amount that was continued. Like a lot of the women stopped playing entirely, um, aside from a couple of the women who were playing in Italy, where there was a semi-professional league in the 60s and 70s. Uh, went from the 70s into the 80s. Um, but I, I, it's a different question from from this film. Many of them were so were so upset and so shamed that they really stopped playing. Um, and you know we could talk for a long time about the individual like cases within them but um but there but but some of the the women have started have picked up playing again and are doing so yeah and and and, and interestingly you know in in the u.s you know the the revival for want of a better word of, of, of women's football women's soccer is driven by the u.s and the investment in the u.s national team that you know most most european countries that play a lot of men's football haven't previously Which invested is, uh, yeah. in it. Only in the last eight, eight or ten years as we've seen that, and particularly I mean, in the UK. I mean, it's a huge reason why we wanted to include the US story, uh, you know, the beginning and the end of the film, is that there's th the reason that women's football was put back on the map, really, came, came from this country. Most other countries, up until the last four or five years, have been playing catch-up to, to the investment the US was putting in from the 70s. And, and it's very presentational, you know. I mean, still women's sports, still, you know, the, in tennis, you know, which is the most pioneering of, of where women have achieved the quality and prize money. You know, it's still the men's final that ends the U.S. Open and ends the the ends Wimbledon. And Wimbledon. You know, yeah. you know. I, I, actually, at the Olympics next year in Paris is going to be the first time when the a soccer tournament's going to end with the women's final rather than the men's, and they're going to alternate. But you know, that needs to happen more widely across sport. Like in other countries, there was truly this existence of sport for men and women were trying to get onto that, that you know, onto the pitch to 
So uh, would you say that um, the reason this sport took off more so in the U.S. than in other European countries is because uh, women's soccer developed earlier than men's soccer in, in the U.S. compared to those other countries? Well, I mean, but then you look at the idea that women's soccer, you know, there's, there's records of women's soccer starting in the 1890s in Europe and in the U.K. I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a more complex question because it's about how much was repressed from the early 20th century onwards in in England and in the UK and in and and across other European countries, but I think the question you have is slightly different as to how um, the how there maybe wasn't so much competition in the, in the US for 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 soccer being a, a big sport. So maybe it does come from that. It doesn't have the natural competition, but it certainly did exist beforehand in in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. We wouldn't claim to be experts on this, but also you have to remember that the US professional sporting system and the college sporting system is much more advanced. You know, the, there, are no, there is no idea of a college scholarship for sport in England, for in any sport, you know? And, and, you know, major sports like rugby became professional, you know, in the 1990s, you know? The, 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 it's just a much more, there's been much less investment in sport, you know, across, across society in Europe. So um, to kind of start wrap this up, I wonder if you guys could divinate a little bit for us. Um, and what do you think is the future of, of women's soccer? We just had a, a historic uh, tournament uh, this summer with uh, crowning a new champion. Spain won the tournament for the very first time. Like, what what do you think we can expect uh, from the sport? I'd, I'd say as as filmmakers, we're not really qualified. Well, but to, to know as a kind of a coach as a sport as a sport as sports fans and maybe as you know yeah i mean you know what's what's heartening certainly and i can only really speak about in england is you know there's been a, a huge amount of investment at grassroots level that in 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 girls playing football you know my daughter plays in a team and they're very well resourced you know there's money going in there's opportunities to coach you know there is uh, uh, a groundswell of enthusiasm and support and, and grounds being opened up. You know, the big challenge in England was, you know, when they banned football, they didn't actually ban women's football. They banned women from playing on football pitches that were like proper pitches, you know, and actually opening up pitches and opening up opportunity creates ownership. So, of, of, of course, it's going to be better than it was it was in the past, but, you know, it still needs more more investment and more commitment and more, more confidence, you know? Yeah, and we hope that, you know, the, the the takeaway, you know, we don't like to use words like message and things, but the, the, a, a huge takeaway from this is that hard-won rights and space is, is hard-won for a reason and isn't guaranteed. And, you know, we hope the audience felt like when you get to the end of this tournament that you lived it, that it was there. It, it, could, it could be anything. And so to have it taken away is incredibly painful, and that's just one tiny example of that. So yes, of course things are positive and of course things are looking so much better in, in a way that they can't have done for a long time. But Yeah, but it needs to flow all the way through. You yeah. know? It's about having you know, more women sports journalists, more women controlling who schedules sports. So you know, why is, I mean, it's difficult to speak about because obviously we're not Americans. So, but you know, women's football in the UK is not scheduled in prime time, you know? But, there needs to be a commitment to scheduling prime time because then people will, will watch it. If they don't have the opportunity to watch it, how can the audience be there? You know, it's, it's a, you know, it's true of anything, right? All right. Well, here's to a better future uh, in all regards. Um, but I want to thank you both for sharing of your time and of the film. Thank you so much for coming out to joining us tonight, and thanks to all of you for attending the screening. So thank you, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.